Okay, let's go ahead and turn to Matthew 22, the end of Matthew 22. We're going to finish out this chapter. We're in verses 41 through 46. Last week we looked at the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians coming to Jesus asking Him questions um, to trap Him, to discredit Him, to make Him look like a, a doofus in front of the crowds, right? So that the crowds would stop following or stop being enamored with Christ and start yelling, crucify Him, crucify Him. That's where we're at. Remember, we're in Passion Week, uh, Wednesday of Passion Week. Christ is crucified on Friday. He's two days away. Um, the Pharisees are doing everything they can to discredit Him, to move it closer to crucify Him, crucify Him. Um, chapter 23, which will begin next week, Jesus lays into them, and that gets them, that just cranks the temperature up in their hearts to boiling to the point where they're ready to, now it's time to crucify Him. But we're right before that, at the end of Matthew 22. Um, this is at the tail end of those, those questions, remember, those three questions. So they asked three questions last week in regards to paying taxes to Caesar, the resurrection, and then the greatest commandment. Now Jesus has a question for them. Their heart was motivated to discredit Jesus and to attack Him. Um, his heart is motivated to reveal truth to them, specifically in regards to His deity. Uh, let's go ahead and read Matthew 22, verses 41 through 46. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David, in the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. So in these verses, we see uh, the Pharisees confirm the humanity of the Messiah, okay, through the line of David. We see in 43 through 45, Jesus reveals the divinity of the Messiah, the Christ. And then this revelation of Jesus or the Messiah's, the Christ's divinity brings upon silence from the Pharisees and no more questions are asked. Let's start with 41 and 42. Pharisees confirm the humanity of the Messiah. It says, verse 41, 41, Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. Um, so, Pharisees come. Well, they, the Pharisees, a couple of verses ago, the Pharisees send their followers, their disciples, and ask him the first question, um, which was regarding um, paying taxes. The disciples of the Pharisees leave. Now the Herodians, no, the Herodians and the followers of the Pharisees come. They ask him the question about the taxes. He answers that question. Sadducees come and they ask him the question about the resurrection. Remember, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. And then he answers that question. They leave and then the Pharisees come back. They're like, oh, you idiots. They can't answer. You guys can't even trap Jesus. So they ask him the question about the greatest commandment. He answers that question. So all those three questions, they're on the offense, right? The difference here, now they're on the defense. Jesus is on the offense asking, asking this question. Notice how he frames his questions. He, didn't ask him, they, he did not ask them directly about himself. He's not, right here in these verses, he's not claiming deity for himself. But he's showing that the Messiah is God. The Christ is God. So notice how he asks these questions. Because he, what he wants to do is he wants the Pharisees to take... Jesus out of their minds, okay? He, he doesn't want their biased opinion of himself bouncing around in their heads when he asks the question. Because he could have simply said, I'm the Christ. 
He is, but in this interaction, he's bringing them along. So he asks the question in a way to remove the bias that they had in their mind. To see, to get them to see what they already believed about the Messiah, about the Christ. Okay, So that was the question that he was asking. He's asking them. Now, out of everybody on the planet, these people should know the answer to this question. These are the Pharisees, the religious elite. These are the Bible scholars, right? So he, he asks these people a very simple, basic question. It's like asking somebody with a PhD a question a kindergartner can answer. Everybody knows that Jesus or the Christ will be the son of David from the lineage of David. Everybody knows that. It's a very simple question. Everybody understand that, right? It's like asking somebody with a PhD something a kindergartner would be able to answer. And their answer isn't wrong, which we'll get to. It's just insufficient. It's just, it's, it's right, but it's partly the full truth. So everyone in Israel knows this. Turn with me to 2 Samuel. How do they know it? How do they know that the Messiah, the Christ, is the son of David? Well, because it's all over the Old Testament. 2 Samuel chapter 7 is where I want to go. Right here, God is confirming the fact that the Messiah, the Christ, the one who is to come, the one that will crush the serpent's head, that is spoken about in Genesis 3, He will come. And He will come through the line of David. Chapter 7 of 2 Samuel, verse 12 and 13 first. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers... The Lord is speaking to David. I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He's talking about the Messiah there. He shall build a house for my name. House is the church. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom. How long? <coughs> Forever. So he's not talking about Solomon, David's son, right? Or anybody else. Because this king will rule how long? So it's messianic. We're talking about the Christ. Drop down to 15. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, the Messiah, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Forever means forever. Christ, Messiah. Turn to Psalm 8, 89. Psalms. Psalms 89. i got to stop doing that. Because when I teach Psalm 119, I put on the board Psalm 119. It should be Psalms 119. Because the name of the book is Psalms. So turn to Psalms 89. Psalms Look at the, look at, look, look what, what, what translation do you have? Do you have ESV? Mine has, at the beginning of the book, the beginning of the book, look at the title of the beginning of the book, the Psalms. So it's book and then chapter. Psalms 89, verse 3. So here we're going to see that the Messiah will be the unique descendant of David, just like we just saw in 2 Samuel. Verse 3, You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Drop down to verse 20. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil I have anointed him so that my hand shall be established with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. Verse 27. And I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My steadfast love I will keep him forever, and my covenant will stand firm for him. I will establish his offspring forever in his throne as the days of the heavens. So, everybody knows that the Christ is coming from the line of David. All the Jews know this, which is why Matthew begins his gospel with 
the genealogy of Christ. Who's Matthew writing his gospel to? And that genealogy, at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, written to Jews to show them that Jesus is the Christ, that's why Matthew puts the genealogy in there, to show the Jew that this Jesus of Nazareth has, comes through the line of David. Amen? Because the Messiah, the Christ, must. This is an interesting fact. The reason why, um, well, not just the reason, but one clear reason, um, that Jesus of Nazareth is in fact the Messiah, is to prove... To prove that an individual is from the line of David, they had all of the, the genealogies in the temple. So these people who want to discredit Jesus, no question they would have went to the temple and find, found the genealogies of the families going down to make sure that this Jesus of Nazareth is in fact from the line of David. Here's the issue with the Jews now believing that Jesus isn't, isn't the Messiah. There is, and they're waiting for the Messiah to come. There's no way that they can verify that somebody today is the Messiah because all of those genealogies, were dist all those records were destroyed when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Does that make sense? Everybody, everybody get that? That's important. It's very important. They can't prove that if, some, if the Jews say that this is the Messiah, this is the Christ, they can't prove that now because there's no genealogies that show. They know that the, the Christ has to come from the line of David. All of those records were destroyed at 70 AD. No question that these who hated Christ went to the temple and searched all the way through the line of David to Mary and to Joseph. So they know that the Messiah must come from the line of David. And that's why Matthew starts his gospel. If you look at Matthew's gospel, it, it, David, it's the son of David, the son of David. Everything's about David through that line. And then also within his gospel, we, we, we looked at, in chapter 9, we saw the two men who were blind in Galilee, Jesus healed. They call him the son of David. In chapter 20, the two blind men in Jericho, he healed. They call him the son of David. They cry out to him, have mercy on us, son of David. In 12.23, Matthew writes, And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? When Jesus was healed the demon-possessed man was also, who was also blind and dumb. And then also remember the triumphant entry, a couple of a chapter, or last chapter. He walks or rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, and they are screaming, the people are crying out, Son of David. It's important, very important. So it's, the answer is right. That's exactly who the Christ is, the son of David. They give a correct answer, but it's a fraction of the entire answer. So what does Jesus do? He reveals to them there is more to the answer than son of David. He's going to show them in 43, 44, and 45 that he is, in fact, the son of God. He is God. Look at 43. He said to them, how is it then that David... In the Spirit, very important, in the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? I mean, this is an extremely simple question, but deep, 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 deep question. So the purpose of the question, again, is to get the Pharisees and anyone else who's around to think about the deity of the Messiah, to reveal the truth that the Christ is God. Um, think about it. No king, especially David. David was the... Like, he's not the king of kings, because Christ is the king of kings, but he is the king. The earthly king. No one was greater than David from an earthly king perspective. He wouldn't call his son Lord. Make sense? That's the argument. That's the point. It's irrational. That's what Jesus is saying. So, so check this out. The, the two most common names that communicate deity in Scripture is the Greek word kurios in the New Testament and then the Hebrew word Adonai in the Old Testament. Now Adonai means master, owner, sovereign, ruler. Okay, so those are the two words. Specifically, let's talk about this Adonai, since we're in, in the Old Testament, because that's the, uh, the, the book that the Jews have clearly showing that the Christ is God, is deity. So Adonai commutes, communicates deity. 
And because God's covenant name was Yahweh, the Jews considered it too holy to say that name. They wouldn't say the name Yahweh. So what they would do is they would substitute when the text, the Old Testament, said Yahweh, they would substitute it with Adonai. Everybody got this? Because Yahweh was too holy to speak, so they would put Adonai in place of it. Follow? All right. So that's why in the Old Testament, go ahead and turn to Psalm 100. That's Psalms 100. Psalms 100. That's why in the Old Testament you'll see sometimes in the English translation, you'll see Lord in all capital letters, all uppercase. And then you'll see Lord, L is capital, but the O-R-D is lowercase. I'm going to show you what the difference is. Psalm 110, Psalms 110, verse 1. Psalm, Psalm 110, verse 1. Psalms. Some of you want me to say Psalms. Some of you want me to say Psalm. What do you say, Starcher? It's uh, Psalm. Psalm 110, verse 1. What's the name of the book? Psalms. Okay. Yes, it's one book. Yeah, it's one book. So they're not chapters. So I can't say turn to chapter 110. Go to Psalm 110, verse 1. How about that? Was that right the first time? Psalm 110, which you can find in the book of Psalms. So what I'm going to show you is the difference between... When the Hebrew text says Yahweh and Adonai. When the Hebrew text says Yahweh, the English translation has Lord in all capital letters. When the Hebrew, when the Hebrew text says Adonai, it, the English translation will have capital L, lowercase o-r-d. Psalm, Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. In the Hebrew, it would read, Yahweh said to my Adonai, or God the Father said to my Lord. Since these words Yahweh and Adonai communicate a deity, David's Adonai, who the Pharisees identified as the Messiah, would all, then also be God. Everybody follow this. Yahweh says to my Adonai. In the English translation, the first one is capital L-O-R-D because that's Yahweh. So Yahweh says to my Lord. Wait a minute. No king would call his son Lord. That's the argument. And to drive the point home, where is David's Lord? Yahweh said to my Adonai, where is he sitting? Say it. Right hand. Right there, the Jews believed that seat is deity. So not only is the capital L-O-R-D and the Yahweh and Adonai deity in, in, in the title, communicating deity through the title here, Adonai, but it also communicates deity in the fact that he's sitting at the right hand of Yahweh. Amen? Jews know this. And then Yahweh told David's Adonai, so God the Father told God the Son, he will put his enemies under your feet. So back in the day, um, when kingdoms would take over and defeat their enemies, they would bring them into the um, the, the room where the king would be sitting on a throne and the enemies would get down on their hands and knees and the king would put their, rest their feet on the, the neck of their enemies. And we find this in Joshua 10, 24. He says, And when they brought those kings out to Joshua, Joshua summoned all the men of Israel and said to the chiefs of the men of war who had gone with him, Come near, put your feet on the necks of these kings. They literally, that's what they would do. Then they came near and put their feet on their necks. So verse 45, if then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? Jesus' point is that the title son of David alone was not sufficient for the Christ, the Messiah. He is also the son of God. He would not, David would not have addressed a mere human being, descendant, as Lord. That's the argument. But what's amazing to me is this isn't new. 
This isn't like new revelation. It's there. <laughs> Amen? It's there. And Jesus is revealing to them what is already there. They just didn't see it. Now, one of the reasons why they didn't see it is because they, the Lord hadn't, the sovereign God hadn't opened their eyes to it. And also, from a human responsibility perspective, they're not seeking it. They weren't seeking it. So what happens? They're like, the Pharisees now, they attack Jesus with these questions. Jesus answer them. Now the, Jesus is on the offense. They're on the defense. Jesus throws out this question, and how do they respond? Silence. Look at verse 46. And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Not only are the Pharisees unable to answer this question, but are just like the Sadducees back in, in verse 34, their response is silenced. Boy, think about their hearts. I was telling you about how their hearts are just bubbling, man. They're, they're, they're just getting, the temperature is cranking up, man. That, boy, that water is getting to a boil inside their wretched hearts. They're, I can't, it's time. And then we turn to 23 next week. Beyond boiling, that's, that we're killing you. It's time to crucify you. But it's a, I'm just, a, I'm in awe of how Jesus revealed this truth to them. All he did was point to the scripture and give a very logical, rational lesson via asking a question, but it's still a question that was designed to teach a lesson, which is the deity of Christ. All he did was go to the scripture and let the scripture speak for itself. A logical, rational lesson. Debate's over. Jesus is the only one left standing. They're silent. And now they're getting even more angry. How? Why would David call the son of David Lord if he wasn't, if he was only another human being? Only. That, and this deity question, guys, this is like all the false systems of religion, they attack the deity question. I mean, Mormonism, Jehovah Witnesses, all those. I mean, just crazy stuff. Some of the things that I was reading with some of these religions, how they just kind of, uh, people that we, they would profess to be a Christ follower, right? They, they, they believe, them, like United Methodists, some pastors that I was listening to some of their stuff, um, not, I'm not attacking the, the, the United Methodist like that whole thing. I'm just saying that there are people within any denomination that are teaching that Jesus is not God, that he's only human. Human. They clearly don't know the Jesus of Scripture. That's clear. They don't know the, why, because they're just like the Pharisees, right? They weren't seeking after it. Um, and that there's a level two that the Lord has not opened their eyes to the, that fact. But he is. He has to be. Matt, John opens his gospel up communicating the clear deity of, of, of Jesus also. But, I mean, people say good things about Jesus. Like he's a good moral teacher. Um, that the one human being that's had the most impact on humanity is this nice guy named Jesus. Um, Muslims call him a prophet. It's just the same as the Pharisees. It's part of the answer but it's important that we all come to the realization that he is God and scripture clearly teaches that amen so that's what he's showing them in these verses let's read these verses one last time and then we'll pray now while the Pharisees were gathered together Jesus asked them a question saying what do you think about the Christ whose son is he they said to him the son of David he said to them how is it then that David, in the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord, Yahweh, said to my Lord, Adonai, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day, did anyone dare to ask him any more questions? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are awesome. 
Amazing. Your word is so beautiful. Um, the clarity of it, these truths that are there. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for revealing those truths to us. Um, allow us to boldly proclaim and reveal um, those, these truths to others um, by your Spirit. And also, Lord, um, send the Holy Spirit to those others to convict them and convert them also and cause them to fall into submission to your deity. Um, Lord, you are amazing. We love and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.